Footprints presents The Incredibles, a series where you meet ordinary but incredible individuals. It's as if I'm in a battlefield. I have to stay alert and keep watching over the forest through my binoculars. No incidents are allowed. I felt I owed my wife a great deal. She sacrificed so much to support me and the development of the forest farm. I saw the forest grow in front of my eyes. It's like my child. I'm attached to the land and I know every blade of grass and tree here. Hello, I'm Zhao Fuzhou. I'm a fire lookout at the Saihanba mechanized forest farm. Fire lookout, one of the loneliest jobs in the world. For the past 40 years, Zhao Fuzhou and his wife Chen Xiaoling have spent six months every year living deep in the no man's land, watching over one of the world's largest man-made forests in northern China. In this episode of Footprints, we will share his binoculars to witness China's green miracle and hear the extraordinary life story of its guardians. Stay tuned. Tomorrow we enter the wildfire season. I'm expecting intense work. We chatted with Zhao over the phone just in time before the start of this fall's wildfire season, which lasts from September 15th to December 15th every year. He's already hunkered down and well prepared in his five-story lookout tower. This is my third day up here. I'm carrying out a check on the fireproofing equipment and the reporting telephone line. I've brought over my daily necessities because I won't be leaving the mountain after entering the wildfire season. As for food, we've stocked up on staples and vegetables alike. I'll be here on the tower 24-7. Though autumn is the best time to visit Saihan Ba, as the turning leaves paint the mountain fiery red, it's also the driest season of the year with little to no rainfall, making it challenging to manage forest fires. Saihanba mechanized forest farm covers over 700 square kilometers, almost as big as New York City. To manage such a vast forest, nine towers have been built and stationed with fire lookouts, watching out for any signs of smoke and fires. So, our job is to report safety every 15 minutes to the headquarters from 6 in the morning to 9 in the evening every day. After October 1st, we enter a critical period when the grass dries up. We tense up and stay on high alert. I would need to be on watch and report hourly, for three hours every night as well. That being said, the telephone line has to stay connected under all circumstances. If you lose connection, you call the maintenance personnel immediately. You can't afford to waste any time. During wildfire seasons, Zhao spent most of his day in the observatory room atop the lookout tower. He wouldn't even have time to go down to the dining room for lunch. With his binoculars, his eyes constantly swim around the pine trees, looking for any alarming signs. It's as if his life depends on the forest. Basically, my life revolves around fire lookout. I don't dare relax or slack off. I keep my eyes wide open and observe through binoculars non-stop. Any act of negligence is unacceptable because it could lead to catastrophes. This is a job that requires you to shoulder great responsibility. For the past 40 years, under the collective efforts of the firefighters, rangers and fire lookouts like Zhao, there hasn't been a single wildfire in Sahamba. In all these years, we haven't seen any forest fire. 
we apply extreme control measures. The only fire emergencies have been house fires we discovered in the nearest villages. They were immediately put out after we reported them. People living in Sai Han Ba have become aware of the importance of fire safety these days. They are careful with electricity. They've stopped burning paper money when visiting graves. It's quite safe now we have a good fireproofing system. Still, we keep guarding the forest. We can't afford anything unexpected. Throughout our chat, Zhao repeatedly emphasized the importance of staying alert and guarding the forest, and he has good reason for doing so. When you visit Sai Hamba today, the astonishing view of the lush green mirrored in crystal lakes would leave you in awe. About 400 years ago, during the Qing dynasty, this was the imperial hunting ground frequented by Chinese emperors. However, the land was later opened up for farming in the last two centuries. After that, years of riots and wars further spoiled the land. By the 1960s, the once robust forest turned into a wasted barren land. Without a healthy forest barrier, sandstorms blew all the way from Mongolian deserts to villages and cities in northern China, turning Beijing's skyline yellow and dim. In 1962, China's forestry authorities decided to rebuild Sai Han Ba by establishing a mechanized forest farm. Hundreds of young students, veteran soldiers, and local farmers were mobilized for a mass afforestation movement. They were the first generation of Sai Han Bai foresters. Zhao's father was one of them. My father enlisted and served in Chengde in the 1950s. After retiring, he was called upon to build Sai Han Ba. Zhao's father then settled down and married Zhao's mother, a local villager. In order to plant trees deep in the mountains, they moved to live in those mountains and endured extreme living conditions. My mother used to recall that back then the weather could be cold, it could make a bull's nose bleed. They withstood so much hardship. They ate oat flour that was too dry to swallow and lived in an underground dwelling. The place was just a pit covered by plastic and straw. They slept and cooked in that one place. Besides enduring harsh living conditions, the first batch of foresters soon found out that they were confronted with a mission impossible. First, the land was uneven with soil covered by stones because the farm tractors they owned could only work properly on flattened ground. They had to rely on manual labor. Then it came the actual planting. In the first two years, about 3,000 seedlings were planted, yet only about 5% survived. It took trials and errors for the research team to discover the right trees to plant and successfully cultivate the vulnerable seedlings. When the first seedlings sprouted, Zhao Fuzhou was born. When he turned 20, the forest started to take form. The second generation of Sai Han Ba's foresters took over their parents' batons to protect the forest. In 1983, Zhao started working at the forest farm and was assigned to one of the lookout towers. I first came to the lookout tower back in 1983. The living conditions were outrageous. No water, no electricity, poor communications. On winter days, we were given two packs of candles and two batteries monthly. I saved the batteries to power my torches so that I could look out for fire at night. When I ran low with candles, I would have to burn our cooking oil for light. I woke up every morning with my mouth and nose smeared with black soot. In summer, we drank water from nearby rivers. In winter, we boiled snow for water. Zhao reported at the lookout tower with his newly wed wife, Chen Xiuling. When Chen saw their new home, she was mortified in the beginning. I was 20. We had been married for just three days. Before we moved to the lookout tower, 
I asked him if we had a place to cook and sleep properly. He said yes. He said the place had been fully furnished. But when we got here, there was just a little bungalow with two rooms. The cooking place was connected to the bedroom. You could say it had a second floor, but you had to climb up and down like an ant crawling in its nest. Seeing the place made my heart sink. But then I convinced myself that after all, I had a new home where we could cook and have dinner together. That's how I managed to endure it for so many years. One year after they moved to the lookout tower, Chen got pregnant. The couple was thrilled. The baby was expected to be born during the Chinese Spring Festival and bring some joy and happiness to their lonely life in the mountain. But seven months into pregnancy, they lost the baby. We could bear any kind of hardship, drinking snow water or eating preserved vegetables without a word of complaint. But we were agonized after that winter in 1984. It was in November when the mountain closed after the first heavy snow. One day I brought back some snow. My wife wanted to boil the ice for us to drink. When she bent over to collect the burning wood, she slipped over and fell. We lost the baby, seven months into pregnancy. Losing that baby is my biggest regret. For Chen, she had to endure another ordeal not long after, which was even more mortifying. My biggest regret is losing my parents in the same year when we were up on the hill. My father passed away in November and my mother in December. My relatives kept the news from me because they knew I couldn't go back with the heavy snow. There was no transportation available. It was not until the next year when my father-in-law came to visit and told my husband. Then my husband told me later. I just simply couldn't take it. Despite their greatest loss, the couple stayed at their post. The young forest was still vulnerable and needed its protectors. I felt I owed my wife a great deal. She sacrificed so much to support me and the development of the forest farm. But at the same time, we both understood the importance of sacrificing individual interest for public good. As the forest grew larger, Zhao's life slowly got better. Entering the 21st century, solar panels, water pipes, and signal towers were built on the mountain. The couple could watch TV, drink clean water, and now browse TikTok videos on their smartphones. The year when we got electricity, Zhao was already in his 50s. He was so excited that he jumped up and down. I told him, a 50-year-old man doesn't jump like a child. He said he hadn't seen electricity his entire life. Now he could finally see it. Since trees stretched taller and taller, the two-story bungalow was renovated to a three-story loft, then to a five-story concrete building. Around 2017, the forest farm you see now fully came into shape. Even the most infertile stony slopes were transformed to healthy land thanks to our fellow foresters. When the lookout towers were first built, we named them Fire Watching Pavilions. Now we call them Sea Watching Pavilions, as the forest has grown to a sea of lush greenery. After decades of hard work, Zhao retired in 2021. But just when he was ready to enjoy his retirement life, he was asked again to come back to the lookout tower. At first, I thought about refusing. After so many years up on the mountain, I've tasted the sweet and the bitter of life. I felt ready to enjoy life and spend more time with my grandsons. But then the head of the farm came to find me. 
He said, I can't leave. He was worried that newcomers wouldn't be competent for the job because they weren't familiar with the mountain. I spent my whole life here, so I knew every river and path. If there was an emergency, I could report with details and take a shortcut. So one year after Zhao retired, the couple went back to the lookout tower. The other day I talked to my fellow lookout friend over at another tower. He's retiring next year. I said, let's do our job right till we die. We have people from every walk of life, and we walk firmly on our path. Then we have no regrets. Now my son has taken over my baton as a ranger. I told him to safeguard the forest, as it's the heritage passed on by two generations of Sai Hamba foresters. Zhao and Chen had their only child, Zhao Dongyang, a few years after they lost their unborn baby. For their son's health and education, the couple applied for a transfer to work near the local village as transportation checkpoint staff for a few years. After Dongyang got to school age, Zhao and Chen returned to the lookout tower, leaving the little boy living under the roofs of relatives. Back then, I was entrusted to the care of one relative after another, first my aunt and then somebody else. For that reason, I transferred from one school to another. I had to get used to different teachers and ended up repeating school years again and again. To be honest, none of us third-generation foresters did well at school. My parents were all too busy to take care of us. When talking about Dongyang's childhood, Chen let out a sigh of regret. She blamed herself for not providing Dongyang with a proper education and enough affection. Dongyang, however, didn't hold much of a grudge against his parents. When I was little, I really envied other kids whose parents could take them to school. But as I grew older, I started to understand them. What I went through was nothing compared to their devotion. So after finishing secondary school, Dongyang followed his grandfather's footsteps, served in the army, and got dispatched to the forest farm as a firefighter. Firefighters here train every day. Our life is dominated by one kind of training after another. Unlike other teams that only work during the wildfire seasons, the fire brigade works all year round. Dongyang worked as a firefighter for 15 years. Then, in 2021, he was assigned a new post as a forest ranger. Every forest ranger is assigned to patrol a designated area ranging from 3 to 7 square kilometers every day. We check potential fire hazards and educate the public about fire safety. Sometimes we also help construct roads, trim trees, or drive away wild animals. Some animals like the wild boars gorge upon young trees. We check on young trees in our area every day to see if they are growing healthily and report any pest problems. To patrol such a huge forest, Dongyang usually uses a car to drive around. Sometimes, if he needs to work till late at night, he stays at one of the apartments built for the rangers. He couldn't be happier with their living conditions today. The change is like night and day. Take transportation, for example. In the past, you couldn't travel around even on motorcycles. The roads were muddy and often got flooded after rain. Now we have concrete roads for cars. In the old days, there was no communication signal. Now we are fully covered. As for work conditions, our staff can now live in single dormitories with private bedrooms and bathrooms. The past generations never had that. To reward the three generations of Saihan Bai foresters, the farm has also built an entire community in a nearby town and allocated apartments to its staff. Zhao and Chen live in their apartment when it's not wildfire season. Dongyang lives with his wife and two sons in the same community. 
My eldest son is fifteen, and the younger one is nine. I personally hope to see my children become the fourth generation of foresters and continue protecting the forest. But of course, I can't make such decision for them. I'm afraid they may leave to see the outside world and never return. Unlike his parents, who had never left Saihanba until recently, Dongyang has been to other cities and seen the bustling city life. He understood that many young people in Saihanba today are attracted to a bigger world, but he chose to stay. I actually thought about leaving, but I'm the only child of the family. My parents have spent years up on the mountain and endured extreme weather conditions. Drinking snow water for many years wouldn't have done their bodies any good, so I was worried about their health and eventually chose to stay. Now Dongyang often stops by the lookout tower to visit his parents and have dinner together. Sometimes he will bring his two sons. This will always cheer up the grandparents. A few days ago, my grandsons came to visit. They told their grandma that they wanted to be the fourth generation of foresters. I said, "Of course you can, but you have to study hard and go to university someday." The forest farm employs college graduates these days, unlike in the past. In the old days, we didn't have enough staff, so anyone over 18 and healthy could come. Now we look for people who understand technology and are well educated. Six decades have passed since the first generation of Saihan Ba's guardians planted the first seed of green in the barren land with their bare hands. Now the third generation is employing the most advanced technology and creative innovations to protect the sea of green. Machines are heavily used today. The fire brigade, for example, employs high-end drones and owns some of the most advanced fire extinguishers and fire engines. For patrolling, we've also installed high-definition cameras on mountain peaks. Our forest farm is fully protected from sky to earth with both technology and manpower. In 2017, the Saihan Ba Afforestation Community received the Champions of the Earth Award, the highest environmental honor of the United Nations. In 2021, the UN again recognized the Saihan Ba with the Land for Life Award for its innovation in land restoration and conservation methods. Saihan Ba has started to draw media attention since winning the honors. In March 2022, as exemplary staff of the forest farm, Zhao's family was invited to fly to Central China's Hunan Province for a TV interview. That was the first time Zhao had ever left his home province and flown on the plane. I'd imagine traveling and seeing the world outside after retirement. My wife and I, we had never taken a plane or the high-speed train. Now that we had a round-trip plane ride to Hunan, I have no regrets. I spent my entire life living on the forest farm up on the mountain. It's my home. I missed here when I was away. I saw the forest grow in front of my eyes. It's like my child. I'm attached to the land, and I know every blade of grass and tree. I've never considered leaving Sahamba. This land is too dear for me to part with. After all, the two of us have spent half of our life here. We gave our youth and our children to the place. With that, we conclude this episode of Footprints. Thank you for listening. Special thanks to our reporter Wang Chen. I'm Man Ling. If you're interested in hearing more about the lives of ordinary people in China, follow us on Apple Podcast. Just a key in footprints, and you can find more stories anytime, anywhere. We will see you next time. Bye for now.